Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Did your wife sleep with a man she didn't know after a party? That's the story today. Enjoy watching it. I slowly came to from a deep sleep. On one hand, I felt awful, my throat was dry, my head was pounding, and my stomach was churning like on a roller coaster. But the warmth in my belly and the sticky moisture between my legs somehow made up for it all. I struggled to open one eye due to the bright sunlight, though later I found out the day was overcast. My condition seemed to be due to the bright sun. I still squinted, trying to shield myself from the light. My body, with bite marks, indicated that the time was not wasted. Closing my eyes, I smiled. I couldn't understand why. There was neither a reasonable nor an unreasonable explanation. Our relationship had been distant for the past few months. Our first meetings were completely different. We accidentally met at work, I was analyzing statistics, and Tom was dealing with security issues. There was a physical attraction between us from the very beginning. I remember being drawn to him so much that I almost broke my rule not to engage in intimate relationships on the first date. Tom was tall and strong, his touch was irresistible. His appearance, with blue eyes and handsome facial features, made me desire him. I was shocked when he refused. I shared my thoughts with my friend Evelyn. She believed that if he was the right guy, he would wait. I decided to listen to her advice. Evelyn had always been attractive, with a well-maintained figure, and it seemed to me that she attracted everyone around her. She always had doubts about Tom. I decided not to hide from her what had happened between us. I hadn't noticed any signs of her attraction towards Tom, but her evident distress caught my attention. I resolved to inquire about it at a later time. In that moment, a foolish grin adorned my face, and I reclined with closed eyes. As soon as the door shut behind us, I found myself enveloped in Tom's embrace. Towering over me by about four or five inches, he effortlessly lifted me off the ground, his lips eagerly seeking mine. I wrapped my arms around his neck, tangling my fingers in his hair as I parted my lips to welcome his exploring tongue. The kiss was intense, our beings fused together. I let go of my purse and the heels I had already discarded for our beach stroll. His arms encircled me, one hand firmly gripping my waist. My squirming woke him up, and he laughed. What are you doing, Marie? Laugh if you want, but I'm cold, I replied, then kissed him between his shoulder blades, my hands wandering along his back. My fingers touched a rough spot, and I looked down. What is this? I asked. On his lower back was a jagged red spot the size of a dime. This is a birthmark, he explained, rolling over and hugging me. All the men in my family have it. When we have children, you better be on your guard. If it's a boy, he must have a spot like that, otherwise, I'll find out you were dating the milkman, he joked. I giggled. I will remember it, but don't worry, I assured him, kissing him deeply. I don't play the fool in any relationship. A few months later, we got married in a quiet civil ceremony. The only disappointment was Evie's reluctance to be my witness. She finally agreed, but I wondered why she was so opposed to me marrying Tom. Tom's witness was our colleague Jay, a poker and fishing buddy, and best friend. David was tall and broad-shouldered, with sharp, clean features and dark, polished ebony skin. I tried more than once to push Evie towards him when Tom and I became close, but to no avail. It seemed like she wasn't interested in him either. Time passed, and at first, everything went well. I guess after a couple of years, we got used to the routine that most couples fall into, work, social events, both business-related and otherwise, and even more work. Intim between us, which started out almost constant, dwindled to weekly, then every other week, and then became really rare. I'm sure I was as much to blame as Tom for the decline of our intimate life. And it's not just our night life, recent months have seen a sharp decline in hugs, kisses, and even simple touches and words that couples use to reassure each other of their love. I tried, and I was sure Tom did too. I worked out and tried to monitor my weight and overall fitness, but too many evenings, I worked late and subsisted on beer and pizza. I fought as hard as I could, but I have gained a few pounds since we got married. Then there was the problem with the children. Tom suggested we wait a few years until our financial situation improved. 
I agreed, enjoying the thought of being able to be a full-time mother when the time came. One Friday, I decided to reverse the trend. I got home early, cooked a roast, and opened a bottle of wine. I saved up my spending money for three weeks and spent it on a new black lace nighty. Timing Tom's arrival, I set the table, lit the candles, and poured the wine as his car pulled into the driveway. Completely forgetting it was the third Friday of the month and he was playing poker with David, Tom was gracious and grateful but reminded me that his poker nights predated our wedding and that I knew it. However, he ate the roast and said it was great. Two weeks later, he surprised me with tickets to a weekend cruise, and hell, they were on the weekend that I was sent to a tax seminar. He was furious and often repeated that I had not told him about the seminar. After all, he would remember if I did, he said. After that, a chill really fell on our relationship. No matter how often I apologized, it did not change his approach that he had put in a lot of effort, and I had ruined everything. This made the announcement of David's big party and how much he wanted us to attend even more of a surprise than usual. Well, I firmly decided that he would not leave me that night. Although it is a shame to go to such lengths to seduce my own husband, it would not have been necessary if I had simply remembered to tell him about this damn seminar. I was wearing a black dress that came three inches above my knees and three-inch heels. Other than that, my only clothing was a red lace shirt. Tom really looked handsome tonight, just as handsome as I remembered him before our wedding. He helped me in and out of the car, paying attention to me, and that was good. In the evening, we ate and then went dancing. I was in heaven, I wanted my husband's body pressed against mine. I moved and pressed myself against him, not caring that I would make a scene. The night was drawing to what I hoped was its inevitable end. I was on the brink of intimacy with him right there on the dance floor. It's funny though. I really couldn't remember any clear details from the night before, other than dancing with Tom around midnight. I couldn't even remember how I left the hotel and returned home. There were bits and pieces, most of them extremely fuzzy, but all of them were vague. We must have had a good time, though. Hopefully, this meant the drought was over, and we would do it again and again. Well, the Saturday morning made up for the hangover. I managed to open my eyes again and smiled as I vaguely saw my clothes hanging on the edge of the bed. Maybe the red shirt worked. Waking up without clothes with a warm body next to me was very exciting. I wonder if I can get to pick up where we left off. Crap, first good night in months and I barely remember anything. I woke up, and now I will remember, no matter what happens. I rolled over, opened my other eye, and began to hug John when I froze. I closed my eyes tightly, hoping that when I looked again, it would all be a mirage. I looked out, but that was not the case. Oh my god, the body I was pressed against was male, without clothes, and black. I suppressed a cry and propped myself up on my elbow. This cannot be, this should not be, but it was David. I looked around the room wildly. I've never been in David's bedroom, I never had any reason to be interested. But this was not my bedroom, this was not my bed, this was not my husband. My foggy brain tried to connect the dots. If it was David, then this was his bedroom. What in the name of all that is holy am I doing here? Well, it was obvious what I was doing here, but I didn't understand how or why. Pull yourself together, Marie, I advised myself. I slipped up from under the sheets grabbed my clothes, and put on my dress. I suppressed a sigh of relief when I saw my bag on the dresser by the door. I picked it up clumsily, shoved the torn lace underwear in, grabbed my shoes, and tiptoed out of the bedroom and down the stairs. I leaned against the wall in the hallway. What the hell do I do now? I had no idea how I got here, how will I get home, and what will I tell my husband? A wave of panic washed over me. I have always maintained that if I am in a relationship, I stay in it, and here I am, not just dating, I'm married, and waking up. My mind shied away from this thought. The most important thing first, I decided, and the first thing we had to do was get the hell out of this house before David woke up and go home. I carefully opened the front door, turned, and ran down the driveway. My purse fell on the concrete, breathing stopped. I felt my heart make one convulsive leap and then stop functioning because leaning on the hood of his car, with his arms crossed over his chest, with such an angry face that I had never seen before, stood my husband. Get in the car, he said through clenched teeth. 
I couldn't think of anything to say or do. I just stood there, unable to move. We drove the entire way home in complete silence. I huddled in the passenger seat and stared out the windshield. I had no idea what to say. He finally broke the silence as we pulled into the garage. When I froze in the car, I said let go. I could hardly hold back my tears. John had never talked to me like that, but I'd never given him a reason before. He pointed to the sofa, sit down. I sat with my knees pulled up to my chin and my arms wrapped around them. I couldn't take my eyes off Jan. He looked so angry and so sad at the same time. God, what did I do to him? He sat down in a chair and stared at me. Long minutes passed. For God's sake, Tom, say something, I finally blurted out. What the hell do you want to hear from me? He almost growled, rising to his feet. He towered over me, and I curled into a ball on the couch. Do you want me to tell you how I woke up this morning in David's guest room and found that you weren't with me? Do you want me to tell you that I haven't seen you since we danced together last night? How about I look for my loving, faithful wife and finally look where I never dreamed of seeing her? Maybe you want to know how I felt when you finally ran out of the house. Maybe you would like to know what it feels like to have your heart ripped out of your chest. Now he was almost screaming. Now I was crying, and the loud sobs were taking my breath away. He sat down on the sofa next to me. Marie, for God's sake, say something. Tell me why. Tell me what went wrong when you were looking for love in the arms of my best friend. I tried to explain, the thing is, I didn't have any explanation. I couldn't remember anything except wild copulation. I didn't even realize it was David, as if it were plausible. I remembered a couple we once knew, she would get drunk from time to time and act like the worst in the world the next morning. Not only could she not remember what had happened, but she also denied that anything unwanted had happened since she didn't remember it, didn't happen. Well, I knew damn well it happened to me, but I didn't remember much of anything, and I certainly didn't remember getting into bed with David or doing anything with him at all. We'll accept this? Judging by the expression on his face when I stammered about my confusion and grief, he didn't believe me. Damn, I wouldn't believe it either, it sounded so lame, but it was true. Through my tears, I managed to tell him that I was very sorry, that I regret everything, that I hurt him, that I betrayed his trust, that I regret the events that led us to this. Finally, he had his fill and turned away. I don't know what will happen next. I can't stay here, he headed toward the door. Someday, I will return. The door slammed behind him, and I heard a car drive away. I just sat there, watching the shadows lengthen and night fall. I turned on the lamp next to the sofa, afraid that the darkness would swallow me. Only the next day did I hear the door open. I was still sitting on the sofa, most of all, I was afraid to go out. I ate only coffee and almost nothing else. Every time I tried to eat, I saw David's back in John's face, and I felt sick. I slept fitfully on the sofa. When John returned, I wanted to rush to him and hug him, but I couldn't. I knew it would be a gesture I would have to earn from him. I just sat there, curled up on the couch, and looked at his face, waiting for some sign. He leaned back in his chair, sighed, and ran his hand over his face. It looked like he didn't sleep much either. Finally, he looked at me. For a moment, his gaze slid away from mine, as if he couldn't stand to look at my face. How could I blame him? I'm not going to divorce you, Marie. I wanted to jump up from the couch and rush to him. God, I was ready to crawl to him for telling me that. I, I don't know if I have ever loved him more than at that moment. But all I could do was whisper, thank you. But everything will be different, I'll tell you that. You'll never be close to David. If he comes to the restaurant, you will get up and leave. He looked at me, raising an eyebrow questioningly. I nodded in agreement. By the way, you won't go anywhere without telling me where you're going and with whom. You will not be alone with any guy in any situation unless I know about it and allow it. He glanced around the house. I wish we could manage on just my income, but it's not feasible anymore. Then, meeting my gaze, he added, having you in the same building during the day brings me peace of mind. Unless, of course, you're engaging in intimate activities with someone there. No, Tom, never. I wanted to assure him that I would never be unfaithful to him at work, but the words failed to escape my lips. 
Until last night, I was certain that I'd never betray him. This is not all. He stood up and began to pace around the room, putting his hands behind his back. He looked at me and took a deep breath. Maybe I'll decide to have a mistress, maybe not. I started to protest and closed my mouth, but he must have noticed how I flinched. He raised his hand and pointed at me. You have no right to protest against this decision, he stood in front of me. Anytime you feel like you can't handle it, I'll give you another option. Tomorrow, we are going to the law office. The divorce papers were filed, and there was a certified check for $10,000. I've already signed the papers. Tomorrow, you will do it too. If you find that you can't handle the consequences of your actions, just show up any day, sign, and collect your check. You will lose the rest of our common property. I shook my head in agreement. You won't discuss this with anyone, even with Evelyn, or should I say, especially with her. She never liked me, and she's going to spread it all over the company, hell, all over town. Now, no one knows about this except you and me, and of course, David. Someday, I'll talk to David and persuade him to keep quiet. Damn, he continued bitterly, at least he owes me that. Oh, and I was planning on sleeping in the guest room, but it was a stupid idea. I looked at him, obviously with some hope in my eyes, because he hastened to add, it's you who will sleep there. He turned away from me again. At least you didn't engage in intimacy with him in her bed, I muttered, burying my face in my hands, but still letting out a scream. Needless to say, I won't engage in intimacy with you for at least six months after we consult the lawyer. I want you to make an appointment with the doctor and get everything checked out that you might have caught. David is a true swordsman. He stood up and began to climb the stairs. I'm going to take a shower. By the time I leave, you'll have moved everything you want to the other bedroom. Hearing the sound of water, I went upstairs to our bedroom. Automatically, I gathered my clothes and moved across the hall. I cleared my personal items from the dresser, removing my presence from the room. I thought for a moment about my things in the bathroom. I decided to leave them. I could buy new toothpaste and stuff. I wasn't going to break his decision by going there to get them. As it turned out, this was not necessary. Later, when he came over for dinner, he rudely informed me that he had packed up my stuff and moved it to another bathroom. The next day, we went to a lawyer's office and signed papers that could end our marriage. When we were done, the only thing keeping me from getting a divorce was my signature on the last page. Tom dropped me off at the doctor's office, and I went through a series of tests. Everything came back negative, but as I already knew, HIV can manifest itself even after six months. Life went on. This always happens. I cooked food, cleaned the house, went to work, and immediately returned home. When I had to go to the store, I would call Tom and tell him where I was going, and I would call him when I got home. I always used the phone in the house, not my cell phone, so that he knew for sure that I was really at home. I never saw David again. I heard rumors that Tom had gone to see him and that there was a lot of screaming outside David's office, indicating that they might have gotten into a fight. I didn't try to find out anything else. Evelyn knew something was wrong from the very first morning at work. She was upset that I refused to tell her. I knew it hurt, we always trusted each other. But I made a promise to Tom. I had broken one promise to him and was determined not to give him any reason to think that I would break another. She finally stopped asking, simply reassuring me that we would always be friends, no matter what. I almost cried. But even weeks after that night, I was still too empty to cry. John treated me politely and correctly, but also kept me at arm's length. There were no words of love, no touches, no hints that reconciliation was getting closer. Every day, he slipped. Once. I made his favorite Sunday lunch, and he ate two portions of stew and was on his third when he finally pushed the plate away. He groaned with happiness, thank you, dear, that was great. I don't know if he hurt himself, but it touched my heart. John continued to commute to work. He continued to go out on Fridays. I knew he wasn't playing poker with David, but he'd apparently found another game. He returned home late at night with the smell of cigar smoke on his clothes and the occasional chip in his pocket. I had to call him one day when I realized I had forgotten a few things at the grocery store. That day, he gave me permission and briefly told me not to bother him anymore. 
I hoped this meant he was starting to trust me again, at least a little. And then the bottom fell out a week later. Just when I started to think that maybe we could get through this, Tom got home just in time. He often worked late, and I closed the computer and books at 4.30 sharp. I agreed on a few swing hours to avoid traffic jams and arrive home or work on time. He went to the buffet in the dining room and poured whiskey into a glass. He walked into the kitchen where I was cooking and added some water and one ice cube to his drink. He stood next to me and took a few sips before speaking. He was harsh. Next week, I'm going to Chicago for a conference. I'm going to leave tomorrow and make a vacation out of this. I've made arrangements with Mr. Jackson, the vice president, to take some time off. I'll be gone for two weeks, maybe more. He turned and looked out the window. Twice he began to speak and then fell silent. For the third time, he cleared his throat and spoke. I won't go alone. These words seemed to echo throughout the house. Now it was my turn to look for the words that haunted me. I was pretty sure he didn't mean me, but I waited for him to say, understand. I'm taking Lynn Richardson with me. Lynn Richardson. I knew her, a blonde with sharp features, large chest, and long legs that she didn't even try to hide. Twice divorced, she was a good risk analyst, but because of the divorces, she would never get very far with Whitaker and company, still tightly controlled by the founder and his sons. They were great fans of family togetherness. She had a reputation for enjoying guys, and for them enjoying her. I knew that John's family would not be a hindrance to her. I looked at John's face. There was determination in him, and perhaps even a hint of anxiety, embarrassment. He knew that I was well aware of what he was going to do during this trip. Yes, I swallowed hard and tried to keep my voice even. Do you want me to take you to the airport? No, I made other preparations. I see. I warned you that this could happen. I know, Tom. Two weeks. Two weeks with her. Are you punishing me too much? I know you're still hurting, but this will hurt me even more. You go out with someone on purpose and leave me behind. This is not an accidental slip from drinking too much. This is a calculation. Maybe so, but it will happen. I want my self-respect back. If you don't like it, go to a lawyer. The rest of the evening passed in silence. Tom packed up while I cleaned up after dinner. As I started to walk up the stairs to go to bed, his voice came from behind me, Marie, maybe when this is all over, it will all be over. Maybe we can get back to where we started from scratch. I looked at him and nodded. I hope so. The next morning, I lay in bed and listened to Tom leave. Finally getting up, I got dressed and ate some toast and black coffee before heading to work. At 9 a.m., I called to make an appointment at the nearest clinic. This time, I only needed one test, and I was pretty sure I already knew the answer. I sat in the waiting room, unable to understand what the hell was going on. A nurse came and took me to the examination room. The test took only a few minutes. The doctor came in with a big smile on her face. Congratulations. I'm pregnant, aren't I? I answered quietly. Yes, of course. She seemed stunned. Is this wrong? No, no, not at all. I smiled at her, stretching my lips in an artificial grimace behind which there was neither laughter nor happiness. I left with a copy of the report and a card with the date of the next meeting. This was a meeting I never intended to go to. I got into the car and burst into tears. Was there even the slightest chance that the baby was John's? The time frame meant that David was the father, that the child was conceived that night. I shook my head sadly. All the work, all the effort, everything goes down the drain. I had no hope of hiding this from Tom. Just when the possibility loomed that we could get our marriage back on track, this happened. This will destroy him forever. John had no intention of raising someone else's child, and I didn't know if I could either. For a moment, I thought about abortion. No, I immediately rejected this thought. Despite my stupidity, the life growing inside me did nothing wrong. I wouldn't dare dictate to other women, but I couldn't terminate the pregnancy. I drove home slowly. I carefully packed everything I could into my car. Despite the agreement, I felt I deserved the car, I brought her into the marriage, 
I was going to take her back. The same went for the contents of the savings account that I opened when I first started working. I never closed it, and my pre-wedding savings can give me a nest. And the last thing to do, I went to see a lawyer. He wasn't there, but his board clerk found the folder and brought the papers for me to sign. He verified my signature and handed me the check. He told me that he would take the papers to the court and file them that same day. Since it was uncontested, the final decree would be issued after 30 days. I stuffed the certified check into the trunk along with the cashier's check that made up most of my savings account. I left my credit cards in a dresser at my old house. I still had one in my name that I never used but kept open because the financial advisor told us it was important to keep the loan in my name in case something happened to Tom. Well, something happened. I lost him. I stood by the car and for the last time looked around the city that I had called home for so long. I took a coin out of my jeans pocket and tossed it. Heads, go north. Tails, go south. I climbed into my overloaded car, started the engine, and drove south along the highway. I had absolutely no idea where I was going, I just wanted to be somewhere else. I'd been driving on the interstate all day. I drove into a well-lit rest area, and there, not paying attention to the sign overnight parking prohibited, I fell asleep. Perhaps I should have found a hotel room, but I didn't want to use my credit card until I could arrange for the bill to be forwarded to wherever I ended up. I didn't want to leave a mark. I felt like a fugitive, which in some ways, I was a fugitive from my old life. Surprisingly, I slept soundly and did not wake up until the sun woke me up. I waited for the toilets to open, freshen up, and headed out again. I just followed the highway, heading south and east, until I reached the sea, three states away from where I started my journey. Here, in a small town, I would start my life again. First things first. Well, there were a lot of important things. I needed housing, I needed a job, I needed a doctor. Surprisingly, my luck seemed to change with the journey because all three of them fell in line one after the other. An offhand comment from one of the county sheriff's deputies led me to a perfect little apartment, a converted carriage house of a large old house owned by a delightful elderly couple. Not only did they make me feel welcome, but they also connected me with a local grocery store owner who needed an accountant. The store owner introduced me to a woman emergency room doctor who taught free night birth classes that were well within my budget. I worked, I ate, I did the exercises, and took the vitamins recommended by the doctor. At first, I spent most of the evenings at home. I didn't bother with the TV, finding that I enjoyed listening to the radio and reading. Since I was careful with money, this led me to the local library. The first night, I joined a literary discussion group. My Thursday evenings were busy from then on. As difficult as it was, I made an arrangement with the adoption agency that my doctor gently referred me to when I finally broached the subject with her. Maybe it was a weakness, but I knew I couldn't bear the stress of being a single mother to a biracial child. I was afraid that I would be offended, that I would blame my own failures and the collapse of my previous life on an innocent child. It is much better to find a home where this child can grow up in safety and love. I thought about Tom often, at least at first. I wonder how he copes. Was he sad? Was he upset by my leaving, or did he regard my departure as good riddance? I didn't leave a note or a farewell message. I know I hurt him terribly, but he hurt me back. I, of course, did not expect that he would forget or forgive without much difficulty, but things went from bad to worse. It's probably for the best that it all ended this way for both of us. And yet, I missed him. There were many nights when I closed my eyes and dreamed of him, but this happened less and less often. I deliberately did not take a single photograph of him from home. I didn't want to remind myself of what I'd lost. Lost once the divorce was finalized, I took the necessary steps to revert to my maiden name. I was no longer Mrs. Cooper, I was Miss Walcott again. Now, I got comfortable and felt comfortable, if not happy. I made friends. I even went on a couple of dates. Of course, my increasingly bulging belly was no match for great slow dancing, let alone intimate propositions, so I continued to sleep alone and rock my boat. Then, one morning, as I was crunching sales numbers and looking for an invoice that I couldn't find, my water broke. Contractions started. Mr. Shaper called an ambulance, and his wife held my hand. 
I will not go into details that every woman who has ever given birth knows. Finally, I managed to make the last push. I heard crying as my baby took his first breath. I leaned back with relief. Miss Walcott? Yes, I managed to answer. You have a wonderful boy. And with these words, the nurse placed a bundle wrapped in a blanket in my arms. Oh no, I shouldn't have seen him. I later learned that my premature birth took the adoption agency and the doctor by surprise. Instead of immediately taking the child away, they gave him to me. I tried to convince myself that I wouldn't look at him. I knew that if I spent even a little time, I wouldn't be able to let him go. But my eyes were fixed on him, and I looked. He was wonderful. His eyes were tightly closed. I unfolded the blanket to reveal ten identical, perfect pinkies. He was the most wonderful creature I have ever seen in my life. And he was white. Somehow, my hands moved on their own, even when my brain refused to process the sight in front of my eyes. I carefully turned the baby onto his tummy and looked at his lower back. The tiny jagged red mark was there. All I could think about was that son of A. I was still in a daze when I left the hospital with Mr. Clifford Walcott. I named him after my father, my parents died while I was in college, and Clifford's last name was mine, not the person who was responsible for him. Over the next few weeks, I was too busy to think about the amazing surprise. Stan and Muriel Ridgway, my wonderful landlords and friends, could hardly wait to babysit and allow me to return to work. They had no children of their own and immediately fell in love with Cliff. When I came home one afternoon and heard Muriel whispering to Cliff about how much Grandma loved him, my eyes filled with tears. Regardless of my current state of happiness or the prospect of a new life, I needed to unravel the events of that fateful night. I sat down and methodically attempted to piece together everything I knew and suspected. Firstly, it was undeniable that I had been intimate with John on that particular evening. It was the sole instance of intimacy in weeks, and it never recurred. Thus, it was logical to deduce that Cliff was conceived that night, and by my husband. Tom's assertion that he hadn't encountered me since our dance together was utter nonsense. Though the night was tumultuous, I was certain I hadn't been with him before retiring to bed, meaning he must have engaged in intimacy with me later that night. No. I fumed inwardly, it wasn't lovemaking. Did I engage in intimacy with David? I couldn't say for certain. I couldn't shake off my doubts, primarily because of what I knew about Tom. If he had enough control to set this up, he would never allow anyone to take advantage of me. Besides, I knew David too. David didn't need to catch his women drunk and unconscious, he could make them line up two by two. And why do I remember almost nothing about that night? Yes, I drank, perhaps more than usual because I enjoyed myself and the new attention from my husband, but not so much as to lose consciousness. Obviously, it was too late to do a blood test to see if I had been pilled, but I was leaning toward that conclusion. Okay, everything seemed to fit. I was set up by my ever-loving husband and took the blame for something I didn't do. But why? What could make John do this to me and then treat me like a leper when I've done nothing wrong? It seemed simply impossible. Did I really know the man I married that badly? Now, I was almost sure that I knew what exactly happened. I just don't know the reason. Over the next few weeks, I considered various scenarios. Maybe it was some elaborate prank on someone that backfired, and everyone ran for cover. Was there any compulsion to do this on the part of Tom and perhaps David? I just couldn't think of anything. Then, one Sunday afternoon, as I was leaving the spare bedroom, someone started banging on the brass door knocker. I had just put Cliff down for a nap and was seriously considering taking some sleep myself. I didn't want anyone to bother us. I opened the door and froze in shock. After a long silence, I heard, Aren't you going to invite me in? Yes, please, I answered, stunned. Come in, Evie. She came in, and I automatically asked her to be quiet. Seeing the surprised look, I tiptoed into the nursery and showed her Cliff. She was surprised. I led her into the living room, she sat down on the sofa, and I was next to her. We were silent for a long time. I looked at her, and she turned away. And finally, I had to break the silence. How did you find me? Car insurance, she answered. 
When you receive the new policy, the state office, which monitors these things, received a regular notification. I have had a standing request for any changes with the justification that there may be an outstanding claim under the old policy, but I did it a few months ago. Why did you wait so long? Evie looked away. I was ashamed, she said quietly, from what, that when you needed help, I wasn't there. And she paused, then continued, and because I knew about John's affair and didn't tell you anything about it, even after I realized that you found out yourself. Evie, I said quietly, what are you talking about? Tom's affair with Lynn Richardson? I knew this had been going on for months. I didn't say anything. Then I realized that you must have found out because you became so withdrawn and upset. I finally got up the courage to talk to you, and then you disappeared. Sorry, I slowly digested Evie's words. Now everything has become much clearer. I started to understand something. That's why we couldn't move forward financially. I put in money, and he took it out. David was undoubtedly covering for him under the guise of weekly poker games. Now I was completely convinced that David's whole episode was set up in order to, to, to what? I still didn't understand it. Yes, it made me defensive and allowed him to do whatever he wanted, but he was already doing it anyway. Why? I shook my head. Evie looked at me with shame, regret, and something else that I couldn't identify in her eyes. Evie, I left the words hanging in the air. Yes, she answered quietly. He took Lynn with him on that non-returnable cruise. I heard them making plans a month in advance, E.V., for God's sake, why didn't you tell me anything? It would have been painful, but my whole life was ruined. Please tell me you had no idea about this plan of his. The confused look Evie gave me was enough to answer. Enough, I told her what happened at David's in the weeks that followed, and she almost fell apart. All she could say over and over again was, sorry, sorry. Why, Evie? Why didn't you tell me? That's the only thing I can't understand about your role in this case. She turned away from me. I wanted someone else to tell you. I tried to convey information somehow, but I couldn't allow myself to be associated with this. I don't understand, Evie. Why did you hope that I would find out this from someone else? Because if I told you, you would hate me. I thought it would ruin everything. I shook my head. I'm still confused. You always seemed upset that I dated and then married Tom. Maybe it was unfair, but I always thought that you wanted him for yourself. No, my God, no, Evie turned to me and took my hands. Have you ever seen what didn't you see? Oh, Marie, I didn't want Tom for myself. I just didn't want you with him. Evie looked at me, expecting. I don't know what. Emotions raced through my head. I found myself at a loss for words, unsure of what to think or say. As I remained silent, Evie leaned in closer, gently taking hold of my hands in hers. Her fingertips traced delicate patterns on my palms, and when I met her gaze, I detected a mixture of hesitation and concealed desire that I never expected to see in another woman's eyes. With a tentative motion, Evie brought her lips to mine, their touch fleeting before pulling back. She looked at me, almost as if anticipating rejection or worse, a rebuff. It dawned on me that she awaited my response to her revelation, whatever it might be. A slight shiver ran through her, betraying her nerves, mirroring my own. Some hidden part of me, dormant until now, must have responded to her, for she kissed me again, this time more firmly. My mind whirled with disbelief at the realization that Evie desired me. But her hand rested on my chest gently guiding me back onto the couch. This wasn't like me. I had to stop. Put an end to it all. But, we made love. The intimacy was passionate and exhilarating, providing a much-needed release after months of abstinence. But in the morning, I got up, fed Cliff, changed him, and sat in the rocking chair Stan had made for me while my son fell asleep on my lap. Again, Evie entered the room, looked at Cliff, then at me and smiled sadly. That's it now, right? She asked. I was sad, but she was right. Yes, Evie, last night was wonderful. Thank you for everything. For confessing to me about Tom, and most of all, for opening this new door for me. But I search for words. But I don't love you, and I think you don't love me either. No, 
said Evie, sitting down on the sofa where we experienced such passion yesterday. She quoted the old saying, the only thing sadder than not achieving your dreams is having them come true. Her lips curled into a sad smile. Maybe it was just a dream, maybe it was a crazy hobby, but no. Suddenly, I finally had you, and as fantastic as it was to be your, your first woman, the longing disappeared. She stood up and knelt down next to me, touching Cliff's forehead with her lips. I touched Evie's face with my fingertips. She turned her head and kissed them. Then we exchanged a long, tender kiss in which there was no passion, only goodbye. She wiped the tears from her face and left, closing the door behind her. I stood up and took a deep breath. It was time to start. I needed to take a few days off. It's time to go back to where I started and end it all once and for all. I thought about Tom. I took another deep breath. Fine. I was angry and wanted to stay that way. It's probably funny when you've changed so much, you don't expect anything else to stay the same. I drove around the town square, and nothing had changed. Well, but I have changed a lot. I arrived in town the night before and stayed with Evie. Truth was stranger than fiction, and we spent the night in pure chastity, even though she only had one bed and we both slept in it. The spark between us, which flared so brightly that evening, almost went out. This experience, thank God, left us as friends. Evie kept an eye on what was going on in the company, especially what John and his sweet little Lynn were doing. What she found out didn't surprise me too much. I spent the morning running errands and meeting some people. I gathered all the information, made several phone calls, and visited the courthouse. I wanted to make sure I had all my stones. I put on a confident expression on my face. I was well aware that I was sick of what was coming, but I was determined not to show it. I drove to my old house, parked on the street, and walked back to sit in one of the two white painted chairs on the porch. There, I waited, trying to remain determined. Finally, Tom's car arrived. He parked the car in the driveway and walked to the front door. His head was down, and I had time to study him as he approached. Damn, he looked terrible. His face was drawn, he lost weight, and the wrinkles that crisscrossed his face made him look ten years older. Fine. For a second, it seemed to me that he was going to climb the stairs and pass me without noticing that I was here. He realized that someone was sitting there and turned his head. It took a moment for reality to sink in. He frowned for a couple of seconds as if he was trying to remember me. Then his eyes opened, and he turned very pleasantly pale. Marie, he tried. I have to give him credit. He tried to find a balance between long-suffering injured husband and thank God you're okay. When he started babbling about how much he missed me and how glad he was that I was home and he thought he could forgive me but how dare I bother him and what made me sign the divorce. Oh, for God's sake, Tom, shut up. What, you can't talk to me like that? he muttered. Of course I can't. Maybe if I had talked to you like that a long, long time ago, you wouldn't have had this affair with Lynn. And then you wouldn't have given me a fake affair. John kept trying. I have no idea what you're talking about. Any so-called romance with Lynn was only after what you did to me. I was ready to forgive you, and you ran away. Damn it, you're really being stubborn. Let's end this. I talked to Evie. I talked to Lynn, I talked to David, my lawyer, and yes, I have my own, contacted yours. I picked up the folder with documents. I have copies of their statements, copies of the credit card bills and bank statements that you hid from me. Which detail your little encounters with Miss Richardson in some detail, starting with a hotel date almost two months before that night. Now, how about we sit down and continue our conversation, or would you rather I start screaming right here? Without another word, he opened the door, and I followed him. I walked over to the chair in the very room where he had been so upset almost a year ago. I carefully placed my purse in the thick folder I was holding on the small table next to me and looked at Tom. He sat down on the couch, and I was struck by the irony of us switching places now. Tom had to clear his throat before speaking. What do you need, Marie? I think the first thing I need is some kind of explanation, if there is one, Tom. If you were so happy with me, why didn't you tell me? I knew we were growing apart and tried my best to solve the problem. But if you didn't want this, why didn't you file for divorce? 
And for God's sake, why did you do to me what you did that night and then treat me like that, Mari? Believe me, when this all started, I had no intention of hurting you. He stopped as I jumped to my feet. I took two steps towards him, raising my hand. You didn't mean to hurt me? I don't have to believe such nonsense. I managed to control myself and returned to my place. Why did you start this affair for no reason, Marie? He replied. She flirted with me, and I flirted back. I put all the energy I should have put into our marriage into pursuing her. I enjoyed the feeling of being a man in the city again. I pushed you into the far corner of my mind. I made a conscious decision to cheat on you, but I didn't want to lose you, he continued. I thought it would be a one-hot, and then I'd find a way to make it up to you, and you'd never know. And then I felt fascinated. I needed answers. But why such a setup? All these clever tricks to make me feel like the worst wife on earth? And then how you treated me? You knew I was innocent, and yet you seemed to enjoy rubbing my face in the dirt. I thought you understood everything. I was sure that somehow I had given myself away. I knew I had left clues to my behavior. Of course, I was guilty. That's why I saw them, although now I understand that you didn't understand that. So I came up with a plan to make you think you cheated. Then I let it get out of control. I nodded almost sadly. Now, yes, it is, he shook his head incredulously. I began to believe my own invention. I thought about it, I managed to convince myself that maybe you really cheated on me with David. I think it was a case of me thinking that if I'm cheating, then maybe you are too. This eased my guilt. As long as I could make myself a victim in some twisted way, it wasn't hard to keep going. I changed the subject. Do you know why I left? I thought you took everything you could. I thought that maybe you had run away for a while and that I had gone too far. But I thought you would come back. I was ready to forgive you and hope that things would somehow return to normal. You didn't come back and didn't come back. Then I received a divorce decree, he snorted. The clerk didn't even tell anyone that an application had been submitted. It never occurred to me that you would do this, and I didn't even think to ask, by the way. When I realized what you did, I rushed to Lynn. I told you the whole scheme. She didn't know this. She may have had the morals of an alley cat, but she was horrified by my actions. She kicked me out of her house and hasn't spoken to me since. About me, woman avoided me like I'm infected with the plague. It's not that I don't deserve it. I can agree with that, I said bitterly. But that's not why I left. I'm an old school, stand by your man woman. I left because I was pregnant. John's jaw dropped. Your setup convinced me that the father is David. Now I know better than I should have known better. David is too much of a real man in town. You wanted to have Inton with a pastor's stout housewife. He would never want me, at least in this state. Tom looked puzzled at my last remark before returning to the first revelation. Are you saying that we have a child? I objected. You, I don't know what you have. As far as I understand, your participation in Cliff's birth was from a donor, no more than I could have achieved with a tube of chilled sperm. John was so excited that my words flew past him. Don't you understand, Marie? It changes everything. Now you can go home. Everything will be the same as it was before. I looked at him, contempt oozing from every pore of my body. Are you saying that now that Lynn left you, you want someone like me back? Well, let me tell you something. If you think that I am still the woman you set up, who you almost destroyed in order to continue your dirty affair, then you are mistaken. I was just as nervous as Tom. He flinched and retreated into the sofa cushions as my voice rose to a ringing crescendo. Now, I continued, sit down, shut up, and listen to what I tell you. You insulted me, you abused my love for you. Physical abuse would not have hurt me as much as the torture you put me through. Luckily, I was able to prepare a little bit before coming here this afternoon. What do you mean? John's voice trembled as he stared at me. I smiled sweetly, leaning back in my chair and stretching my legs. Don't you understand yet, Tom? I already told you that before I came to you. I stopped to talk to David. And it was a wonderful conversation, although I admit we didn't talk much. John's eyes bulged out of his head. 
He looked at me with disbelief, which turned to horror when I continued. You know, Tom, damn it, if you wanted me to have an affair, you should have given me one for real, with David. Do you have any idea what he's like when I pleasured him below the belt? He make a sound and told me that if he knew what kind of wife you have, he would have taken me from you long ago. It never occurred to him that a simple old white housewife could be like that. Of course, he liked night with me even more. God, we look so hot, his shiny black body pinning me to the bed as I screamed for him to never stop. His endurance, let's just say, I begged him to stop before it was all over. Yes, speaking of children, this time I think he definitely impregnated me. After all, I am at the most fertile point in my cycle. Oh God, no, John covered his face with his hands. I can't believe you did this. I sat up straight in my chair, placing my clenched fists on my hips. Of course, I didn't do it, you damn idiot. Do you really think I'm so damn stupid? I just went through a month-long scare, and you think I'm going to start the cycle again? Also, David, if you haven't heard, met a wonderful girl at his church and is getting engaged. We talked, and he apologized over and over again for his role in your stunt. He said, and I believe him, that he had no idea you would go this far. I got up, not feeling very well, and I endured this for many months, unlike your five minutes of suffering. I let the anger shake me for another minute, then I took a deep breath and held it until I stopped shaking. As I exhaled, I remained calm and focused. That's enough, Tom. I've thought of several cunning plans to take revenge on you, to cause you the same pain as me. I know I can make you lose your job. I can file a criminal case against you. Those blood tests you made me take, all sorts of things appear, including illegal substances. I wonder why the memories of that night are so scattered. Is this the case? My friends include a very nice high-ranking police couple in my new hometown. They made me talk to the district attorney. Does the word conspiracy mean anything to you? I assure you that David, E.V., and everyone else will testify in a minute. I took the folder I brought with me. But that won't happen. Not because I have any feelings for you, but if you're out of work or in jail, you won't be able to pay child support. Besides, my voice became thoughtful and a little sad as I thought again about how things turned out with this person. Besides, I'm not going to waste my life on you anymore. I've wasted enough heartache in suffering. I will live in the future, not in the past. I handed him the folder. So here it is, our new financial agreement. I get 50% of what we had at the time of the divorce. I'm even giving you a $10,000 loan. However, you will be reimbursed for your little cruises and all the other amenities you showered on Lynn. In addition, you agree to pay a regular percentage of your salary and child support until Cliff turns 18 or graduates from college. You can discuss this with your lawyer. He has a copy. He will offer to sign it. He doesn't really like the word conspiracy either. I gathered my things and looked at him. Have questions? He shook his head silently. I nodded and headed towards the door. Goodbye, Tom. And all the way home, I never looked back. Another year has passed. I still talk to Evie sometimes. I don't ask about Tom, and she doesn't tell me. This is a turning page of my life. I still sometimes wonder how things would have turned out if John had been strong enough to resist the urge to cheat or at least not fall for this wild plan to cover his tracks. But I don't spend much time thinking about these things. I still live with Cliff's wonderful step-grandparents. I still work at the grocery store. Yes, I could buy a house and maybe get a more prestigious job, but I'm happy where I am. I have many friends in this warm city. When Cliff and I leave the house, we spend half the time waving and greeting friends on the street and talking to people we know. The child support Tom pays each month goes into a trust fund for Cliff and his college education. I used some of my income to buy a minivan and with Stan and Muriel's permission, converted the top floor into additional bedrooms. Why do I need additional bedrooms? Because I still hope. I didn't understand Tom. I didn't understand that although he was physically strong and handsome, he was weak in relationships. Let it be so. I don't hate him. I just feel a little sorry for him because he would never have me again. And I decided that I was a damn good catch. Not long ago, we talked on the phone. 
He would like to see his son someday. That's good. I won't interfere. He even asked if Cliff could spend the weekend with him when he was older. There's a wistful quality to his voice when he talks about what they could do together. This is amazing. A man should take his son to a ball game, fishing. Not that Tom is a fisherman. Camping, whatever the boy and his father need to do together. I would like to have more children. I wish I could find someone again to share my life with, someone I could trust. It can take some time. I am dating. I met a paramedic who works at the hospital, and he's damn cute. I think Cliff may have to spend Saturday night with his grandparents again. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. For me, it is now when I look in the mirror. I see a woman who can stand on her own two feet and live her own life. So until I find that person I can walk with, I won't be afraid to walk alone. What do you think of today's intense story? In my opinion I think the story was full of plot twists and quite interesting. What is your opinion right in the comments? See you in the videos.